Welcome to the Tamarind Learning Podcast, where host Dr. Kirby Ross Plock speaks with experts on many topics relevant in the ultra high net worth family wealth management space. Kirby is author of several books, including The Complete Family Office Handbook, and shares her expertise consulting with families and family offices. Kirby is also the founder of Tamarind Learning, an online wealth education platform that develops practical, foundational learning programs for beneficiaries to help them prepare for responsible stewardship of wealth. Welcome to the Tamarind Learning Podcast. My name is Dr. Kirby Rossbach, and I'm your host today. Today, we're talking about succession in crisis, and I'm pleased to have with me Octavian Pilati, who will share more about what he experienced when his family and their family business was changing hands and what was happening to create a lot of stress and anxiety. So Octavian, I'm thrilled to have you here today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Well, tell us a little bit more about your story, Octavian. I am so fascinated by what you've endured and experienced and what your family's gone through. And perhaps you can share more with our listeners about what happened when it came to succession in your family. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, To put things short, our family business has been in the in forestry and agriculture for many years. So I'm a descendant of one of Austria's princely houses. we have been busy in agriculture, politics for about a thousand years. And it's the family Kevenhuller Metsch. If you're from Austria, you probably have heard of them. And in 2014, we had a crisis in our family business, which lasted to about 2018. And in the middle of that crisis, we had a leadership succession from my father on to me. And what's also important to to know to understand the dynamics that unfolded is that we starting 2009 we started having succession talks between my older half brother myself and my father and as you can probably guess that by the time of 2014 it was still in the hands of my dad we didn't get very far in those succession talks which which added some extra spice to the crisis i would i would like to say and the crisis itself unfolded due to an investment my father made where he leveraged our land, which was the, the basis of our um, family business. And the company he invested in turned out to be fraudulent and went into mm-hmm. bankruptcy, which, which triggered the guarantees. So that's what basically triggered the whole thing. That is just a tragic and uh, I mean, I can't even imagine the um, pain and suffering that, I mean, I'm sure your father felt knowing that he inadvertently thought he was probably just doing some financial engineering um, and had no idea what this one investment, how it could completely undermine, you know, his whole legacy, right? Yeah, it it, it took him some some time to for it to settle. That's something that when when crisis hits and crisis hits from a decision you have made, you will see this in people quite often that there's a phase of of, um, where people don't want to see it. They're like, oh, it's all still fine. Things will work out. It's not as bad as it seems. And and that's why often in in crisis, it can be a good idea to have a little bit of a change in leadership or get some extra advice in, uh, which also was the case in, in, in our family. Well, and tell us a little bit more about your role. Um, how were you impacted by what happened from this investment? And, and tell us your story. Yeah. So at the time, I was still a student in 2014. Uh, start, things started unfolding a little earlier in 2013, but I, I wasn't much informed about matters. My dad and my half brother always said, well, you're a student, you're still young, finish your studies. You don't need to worry. And in 2014, more and more meetings were taking place with other investors and a new CEO who came in. And the meetings were happening in English language. And I studied, I went, I went to boarding school in the UK. So my English is, is pretty good. And my dad doesn't speak English. So that's how I started getting involved, just to 
come along and translate for him. So that's where I started to have my first impressions and was thinking, well, let's see how this, this is going. And in, in November 2014, there was the annual general meeting. And that's when the, the new CEO who came in a few months prior announced that he found some, let's say, fraudulent documents and that mm. he thinks the company is a fraud. And that's when, when it, it really, when it, that, that's when it was official that we, we are going to have a problem. And the, the first thing I did back then, I still remember I was, I, I sat down, I was like, oh dear. Okay. I, I live off my family. I, I, I had a good student life. I didn't have to worry about anything. If this has gone tomorrow, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I, I got a, I got my first proper job back then. I would always uh, work for the family business on, on, on weekends, sometimes or part time or in the summer. But I got my first proper paid job with, with another company. Um, that, that was the first thing I did. And I started there in March the following year. And tell us how this unfolded. What happened next after, you know, helping translate some of the uh, English gaps for your father? And um, how did things escalate? Well, I, I still continue to translate. And the first big change for me personally was in, I believe it was June 2015, where I still remember it vividly, I sat in, in Munich in a beer garden with my colleagues because the company's headquarters was in Munich and we would go there once a month for a, for a meeting and then we would always hit the beer garden afterwards. And I got a call from our lawyer who on the phone asked me if I had read the email. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, read your emails and then call me back. So I was like, okay, I, I read my emails and, and my dad and my, my older half brother went on holiday um, to, to relax a little bit. And my dad wrote an email to our lawyer, the, some other investors and the CEO saying that he is away for two weeks. And in the meantime, his younger son, Octavian is going to handle matters. So if anybody needs anything, here's his number and his email address. So yeah, that's uh, when I had uh, my first uh, taste of two weeks of, uh, kind of being in the driver's seat. I, I honestly. I talked with the lawyer and we agreed that I would just say, I will think about it or no to anything I was being asked for two weeks. So that's basically what I did. Not, 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 uh, I didn't have a clue what was going on. So, um, I, I stuck to that plan and it, it worked out well. It worked out well. Well, it <laughs> certainly helped you get through that probably really, um, stressful period where you're stepping into shoes that you hadn't, you know, previously had the um, ability to prepare for as well as, you know, having to think on your feet really quick, quickly and react to what was being asked of you. Yeah, yeah, precisely. And um, so I did this for two weeks. My, my dad came back from holiday and our lawyer asked him to come to his office and bring me along. And I, I thought it's just going to be a kind of debrief of what's happened the last two weeks. And in that meeting, the lawyer told my dad that he would suggest handing over the crisis management uh, to me. And um, I had no idea he was going to suggest that. And my dad, in the, in the moment there, he just said, okay, if that's what you're suggesting, that's what we're going to do. And, and asked me if I'm ready to do this. And uh, I felt very honored and actually very happy to be asked. And without knowing what this would mean for me, I said, yes, I am. And that's when I ended up kind of handling things for the family in the, in the crisis. And yeah. Well, tell us, tell me a little bit more about what you learned about yourself, what you learned about your family, what you learned about business succession, doing it during a crisis? Well, first thing I learned, which was a major problem afterwards is if you, we should have had a chat in the family about this with everybody uh, who is impacted by this decision, which, which we didn't do. My dad just uh, decided on his own. 
and other people were, let's say, not very happy with how it went. So my half brother and his wife, who she's she was a lawyer, uh, she's a lawyer. He studied economics. They were always advising my father, and it was it was the yeah. three of them handling things. And my brother had his own company, his own um, his own family. So he he said, look, I I don't want to drop everything to do this. I'm happy to advise, but I'm not going to step in. And he would have liked to be consulted because he didn't think it would have maybe been the wisest idea to put a 25 year old in charge, um, which was uh, some very good points there. Looking looking back at it. So that was the first thing that impacted the family dynamics, not positively, let's say. Uh, secondly, it's what what happened to me, and I see it with other next gens sometimes or rising gens. You believe that you have some decision making powers, but you don't mm. really. So mm. I, I was crisis manager, but my father still had or legally was the one who had to make the decisions. And to a certain point, I could make decisions and he wouldn't mind. But after a certain, after this certain point, it was him. So mm -hmm. we did have some moments where we, where we, the lawyers and I and other advisors, we made a plan and he then said, no, we're not going to do it this way. And then it's back to a drawing board. And, and that, those were the moments when, where I sometimes sat and thought, oh, maybe I, sh am I really up for this? Is this really how I want to work? Kind of thing so that's also something that i you should always ask yourself what am i really in charge of and who makes decisions for what and when and where are the boundaries that's another thing i i very strongly um, learned and you know if the family foundation and emotional foundation the, the, the relationships between family members if there's any cracks if there's anything that's not stable that will show more in times of crisis pressure comes on everybody and things will come up any all the let's say emotional traumas maybe from from the last from your childhood whatever those things come up people start quarreling about really unimportant things in the moment but it, it happens and that's something that can be rather surprising not only for yourself but also for your advisors certainly that family dynamic is a wild card um, in a crisis situation. And I think I love that. I mean, I'm sorry you had to learn this horrible lesson about the the rule of law and authority and legal control and why that has so much basis for crisis management, because it sounds like you had tremendous responsibility, but really ultimately your father had ultimate authority. And that means that you could be doing, working really, really hard towards what might be a very sound solution. But if ultimately he disagreed with it, to your point, you're back to the drawing board. So that, again, can erode, I'm sure, that relationship with your father um, and create stress on that personal, that family side. It's definitely. So it, it eroded trust in the whole family. The situation, the way the decisions, the decision were made. I then also that's something I didn't do very well. I I then uh, had a tendency to secrecy at some point, where I said, okay, mm -hmm. the later I tell people about what we are planning, the the less likely somebody is to interfere and like break things again. So that was also and and again, if if you're listening, secrecy is never a good idea. It it just means that the work becomes more and the quarrels become larger. Yeah, and it sounds like too, and, and, and I'm parlaying from other families I've worked with, I, I'll say my own family too, that um, when information is withheld and then sort of released under these duress circumstances, everyone's blood pressure goes up, spikes even farther, faster. And it also can sometimes just be like pouring gasoline on a fire, which, creates an accelerant. And so instead of actually getting to a solution, you're actually deepening, right? Those um, family schisms and those family fractures that, um, you know, were already on shaky ground. And then this just creates even more anxiety, animosity, and distrust. And I think you hit it on the head when you bring that up because 
um, ultimately crisis doesn't typically bring families together in a way that makes them more trusting. It typically um, expands their distrust of, you know, sort of old pains and old scars and wounds that might have you thought were in the rearview mirror. They all just come right back to the present. It depends. I think there's a tipping point. And if you're before the tipping point, a crisis can bring the family together where you say, OK, we have this problem. We need to solve it. Let's do this. It gives it gives the family a unifying mission to tackle. But if you have if you're beyond the tipping point, it gets terribly chaotic uh, mm. where you say, OK, mm. uh, if so, that's why I always like to say, you know, your family can be a resource very good resource for your family business, but it can also be a big problem. And that depends on how you deal with the family, how emotional stable the family is. So how is your, what essentially is your behavioral risk? And if you look at it, there's uh, studies on this, that in most cases, when a family loses its wealth, it is, and, and that's over 80% of the time, it's down to the family members themselves. So your your own family is the biggest risk to your wealth actually i'm so glad you um clarified that because i do totally agree with you on the tipping point concept and that you know there's basically um impending crisis in a lot of our lives right um it's just how we choose to prepare for what we know what change is coming and then that might also impact whether it's even a crisis at all right? It might just be a transition. It might be just a normal leadership succession or ownership succession or exit of a business. Um, knowing what you know now, what are you advising families based on your own personal experience to do differently? Um, crisis is bound to happen at some point. So prepare for it. You can you can make a crisis management plan where you agree ahead of time. Okay, if crisis hits, this is who will be the crisis manager. This is going to be our crisis committee. Uh, these are the family members who will be in charge of this and that and help here and there. You can plan this roughly um, because crisis is always different. But again, they're all very similar, at least from what what internally will happen in the family and in your business. In crisis, it's important to discuss things openly. So don't be secretive, share the information, use the swarm intelligence that you have in the family and maybe also apply swarm leadership to it. You, you don't need a crisis manager in charge of everything. Uh, you might have somebody who is an engineer in the family. The next one is a lawyer. You can assign different areas of expertise and responsibility uh, to them. And something that that hit me very hard on the on the head after our crisis where family relationships were damaged uh, reputation was damaged in the end it, your family business yes it's your legacy but in the end it's about financial wealth and financial wealth you can if you keep your connections if you keep good relationships with in the family you can reforge that wealth but if you're break those relationships, if you if you ruin your reputation, if the knowledge transfer between generations is damaged, those are much harder, much more difficult to repair. So I would always say family first, then the wealth and the, and the family business. I, that's something that I, I highly suggest to anybody who, who ends up in a situation like this. And finally, the, the best investment you can make to preserve your wealth is into the family, into the, the emotional connections between family members. Repair what you can find. Sometimes you can't repair things that have been done in the past, but you can find a, a modus operandi where you can still have a trustful relationship with each other. Invest in that. Get, get the help that the family needs to strengthen that foundation of the family. It's like if you want to build a skyscraper, on sandy ground without building the proper foundation. It's just going to topple over the first time a little bit of a stronger wind will come up. You want it to weather a storm and an earthquake if you can. Wow, super powerful. Thank you so much, Octavian. It's so great to have you 
on the Tamron Learning Podcast today. I want to point out Octavian is a prolific blog writer. So if you're enjoying hearing his thoughts on crisis management and succession, self-management, I want to point to you, um, there'll be some additional links that you can check out about crisis management starts with self-management, 10 learnings from managing a crisis in a family business, turning your family conflict into opportunity, why emotional stability protects your wealth. So again, I want to just put a plug in for a lot of what Octavian has taken, sort of a pretty tragic and very stressful situation in his own family experience and turned it into something we can all learn and grow from. So Octavian, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Really powerful story. And thank you for your courage and your leadership through a really difficult time. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. Thank you.